شنن گیبت کلی وردت فاندیشن اجازه خون صبر تو دنا دیشن این به سبب که کما گنا لا خقد لینا بدا یا سورا اینا شان سما زودا قتیبنا لا خسورا بدا یت این بس سو اجازه خون این دیشن سمانا On behalf of the Board of Assyrian Foundation of America, I would like to thank you for joining us for the seventh annual appreciation event. As you all know, and as Flora mentioned, the Assyrian Foundation of America has always been consistent in its mission supporting the three programs, which is needy, which is education and cultural, and the publication of Nidwe magazine that has become a global voice for many readers and subscribers. I want to take this opportunity and introduce to you the Board of Directors for 2017. I'm going to start with our Vice President, Martin Jacob. Martin. <laughs> our Secretary, Jean Carignan. <laughs> Social Chair, Flora Kingsbury. <laughs> Treasurer, Belus Yadegar. Membership, Sargon Verda. <laughs> Needy, Sargon Shabas. <laughs> Education, Dr. Robert Karukian, who is not with us, unfortunately, but let's give him a hand. Uh, Nibir Magazine, Nibir Maraha. <laughs> and Building Committee, Daniel Ficaleta. <laughs> so, as I mentioned before, the purpose of the appreciation event is to thank all of our members, friends, and support uh, for supporting us, and to continue supporting us to continue our mission, and to show them how their contribution is helping us to help our nation. Today, we're living in a um, survival mode. Our people are living in dire situation. Currently, we are managing these situations by bandaging the problem. Assyrian Foundation of America will continue to support the great organizations such as Assyrian Aid Society, Assyro, Assyrians Without Borders, and many others that are working tirelessly on the ground, in the field, to help our people. However, this is not sustainable. We need to have a plan not just to survive, but to live. We cannot rely on hope. We cannot rely on other governments to help us. And with that, I wanted to share with you a story that I learned when I was in fifth grade. There was a family of birds living in a nest on a tree in someone's backyard. So one time, the son, the bird, comes to his dad and said, Dad, I'm so scared because I heard the owner of the house wants to cut the tree. So he said, son, what did you hear? He said, I heard him ask the next door neighbor if he can borrow his tools and come and help him to cut the tree. And the papa bird said, Sonny, don't worry, we're going to be OK. The next day, the boy comes again. He says, Dad, this is getting serious. He's going to cut the tree. He said, OK, so what did you hear today? He said, I heard him pick up the phone and call his friends and ask them to bring their tools and help him to cut the tree. And he said, don't worry, we're still OK. The third day, the son comes and says, Dad, I'm really, really scared. He goes, son, what did you hear today? He said, I heard him talk to his son and telling his son that, Sonny, we cannot rely on people. We're going to go to the store, buy all the tools we need. We're going to come and cut this tree together. That's when the papa bird told his son, now it's time to move. The morale of this story is self-reliance. That's what it is, it's self-reliance. And that is what our dynamic speaker, Michael Uesh, who's here, is going to elaborate on that today, on that subject today. I want to tell you a little bit about Michael. Michael is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. His research project focuses on parliamentary transformation and contributes to the scholarship on constitutional design, federalism, deliberative democracy, and identity politics. When I met Michael for the first time, I was blown away by his intelligence, his energy, and his, the fire in his eyes, and the passion, and mostly how he was forward thinking. 
And Hobby had so much passion to help Assyrians to grow and become stronger as one nation. This thing is Assyrian self-reliance, the only path to our survival globally. And with that note, I want to invite Michael to come on the stage here. Shalom alaykum. Shalom. And the same way, 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 the I don't consider it uh, something to take forward, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, I, I consider it a privilege to be here. Uh, the Assyrian Foundation of America uh, has a reputation that precedes itself, and you'll see by the conclusion of my presentation just how connected I am to the Assyrian Foundation of America and what it means for the theme of this subject. You know, I want to say thank you to the entire board of the Assyrian Foundation of America. Um, yesterday evening we had a very important meeting but in a very wonderful venue with extremely wonderful food and good conversation um, at your board member, Sergeant Huerta's house. And I want to thank all of you for attending that um, because it's to discuss in detail organizationally what I'm presenting to you today. And I want to tell you, yes, some of this material comes from previous presentations. You'll benefit from hearing it, but it's, it's not just repurposed. We've been making progress for two years on this idea. And everything you're hearing is going to elaborate where it's actually going to take shape as a, a way of opening our eyes, a way of making us think about how our organizations are structured and see themselves in the community and see themselves as parts of the Assyrian nation. Sepereo, I've asked uh, Wilfred Bet Alkas, Dr. Nicholas Algilu, and a number of other linguists to give me the best Assyrian translation of it. Sapere ode is a Latin term. In Latin, it means dare to be wise. It literally translates into dare to be wise. But what it means is have courage in the face of the truth. Because let's face it, sometimes we don't like to hear the truth. Sometimes we don't want to admit what is right in front of us. But we will not progress, we will not survive as a nation if we continue to lie to ourselves. We must come to understand that for a hundred years now, at least, we have modeled the Assyrian national cause in a failed paradigm. We've been working within a failed model failed methodology. For 100 years, a Syrian nationalist organization globally and in Atra has failed to stave off genocidal violence, demographic decimation, assimilation, and every other type of affliction and suffering that we've endured. We have failed to counter these pressures. We have to have the courage to accept this reality in order to find new solutions. That methodology is what I call the Assyrian question as foreign determination. You all know, I'm sure, Professor Joseph Yakub. When I was growing up, my uncle bought me his book, The Assyrian Question. Yellow book cover, red font, okay? That defined the idea in the 1980s of something that had existed since the League of Nations that the Assyrian question which was a committee at the League of Nations called the Assyrian question there was the Jewish question all these small minority nations were questions to foreign Western powers who were carving up the world and we umtenaye imbibed we adopted and internalized in our Umtenaya nervous system, the idea that our question is a question that is determined by foreign powers. The Assyrian question as foreign determination is the failed methodology. It's how we've organized ourselves in terms of 
our survival. My goal to shake us out of this, the truth that we need to come to terms with, is that we must switch from the Assyrian question as foreign determination, not switch, we must reject it. We must realize that it's a source of building our dependency and vulnerability and switch to the Assyrian question as self-determination. And that is our own self-reliance. No one will save us. No one has saved us. No one will save us. We have to find a way to save ourselves. My goal in this part of the presentation is for you not to believe what I just said. I want to show you. I want to show it to you. The Assyrian question is foreign determination at the United Nations Human Rights Council. CERD is the Committee for the Elimination on Racial Discrimination. It is a body within the United Nations systems of genocide scholars and human rights uh, uh, bodies that issues determinations on imminent genocide. In August of 2014, CERD issued a statement declaring that what was happening in Deshtid Ninwe and in other areas in the Middle East at the hands of ISIS against our people and against other vulnerable peoples was genocide. A CERD determination is supposed to trigger UN system action. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. At the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, the 28th session in March 2015, the Assyrian nation was represented there and advancing its cause. And their entire focus at that session was Iraq, Syria, and ISIS. And at that session, do you know what they determined? Not that genocide was taking place, that Genocide needs to be investigated and the perpetrators need to be brought to justice. But help for the victims was not discussed. Solutions for the victims of genocide was not formally addressed. Dr. Hannibal Travis, perhaps one of our nation's foremost experts on genocide history, genocide law, and human rights, in a 2013 lecture talked about the UN's muted reactions to genocide. And he suggested reforms, said we need to build on human rights, the human rights norms, the human rights paradigms, for example, like cultural genocide. And so what I discovered when, when I was there at the UN Human Rights Council in March 2015 is that even through the Assyrian Aid Society of Iraq, our mission didn't become getting them to recognize genocide we needed to reform the UN system for them to then help us for the genocide we were enduring. So imagine this small, vulnerable, persecuted nation had to, has to accept the challenge of changing the UN system before the UN system is willing to help it. The Assyrian question as foreign determination failed us and is continuing to fail us. In March 2016, U.S. Secretary of State Kerry, uh, uh, John Kerry said, my purpose in appearing before you today is to assert that in my judgment, Daesh is responsible for genocide against groups in areas under its control, including Yazidis, Christians, and Shia Muslims. That's genocide recognition from the Secretary of State. That same day, the Washington Post reported, State Department officials said that beyond that the finding imposes no new obligations beyond what is already being done, but that it could galvanize other countries to step up the battle against the Islamic State. And a State Department spokesperson said, and I quote, is it going to trigger something new? Genocide recognition. Is it going to trigger something new? No. But it is very much part and parcel of the way we have been thinking about this conflict for nigh on over a year. The Secretary of State recognized genocide is taking place, and that very same government said, but that doesn't mean we have to do anything more than what we're doing already, which is nothing. That is the Assyrian question as foreign determination. And if you think that that genocide recognition has to do with the fact that maybe they don't love us, maybe they don't care about Assyrians. In 1994, in Rwanda, 
Secretary Warren Christopher said in terms of the Rwandan genocide, if there is any particular magic in calling it genocide, I have no hesitancy in saying that. But on the same day, he said that it would not trigger anything new. Is there any particular magic in calling it genocide? No. This is in 1994, 20 years before ISIS entered the Ninwet Plains and other areas where Assyrians live. In 2004, Secretary of State Colin Powell, when asked about recognizing genocide in Sudan, said, let us not be too preoccupied with this designation. These people are in desperate need and we must help them. Call it civil war, call it ethnic cleansing, call it genocide, call it none of the above. The reality is the same. And yet, our nation devoted all its energy in the diaspora to getting genocide recognition. We all, I did too, we have all invested ourselves in genocide recognition, but we ignore these truths. In 2007, the U.S. Secretary of the, the, the Committee on Appropriations required the Department of State to report on what it was doing for Assyrians in the Ninwe Plains. 2007, the House Committee on Appropriations required the Department of State to report on what it was doing for our nation. The response came to the chairperson of the subcommittee. At that time, it was Congressman Wolf. So this is a State Department report. The answer that the State Department gave was, in Nenua, the Christian minority faces hard, considerable hardship. Some factions are underrepresented politically. In another State Department report, they acknowledged that Peshmerga entered our areas, picked up the ballot boxes, took them away, brought them back at night full. So underrepresented politically. Some suffer from uneven resource transfers from the Kurdistan Regional Government's Ministry of Finance, and some experience human rights abuses. So there's economic discrimination. This is the U.S. State Department documenting these things. Furthermore, uh, and some experience human rights abuses, direct physical violence. Furthermore, Nenawa absorbs a significant number of Christian internally displaced persons moving from the south, placing an economic burden on the area. Nonetheless, most informed observers believe that in terms of economic status, essential services, rule of law, and human rights, this minority compares favorably not only to other minorities, the Yazidis and the Shebek, but also to the Arab majority. And here's the line. Thus, on the basis of relative need, it would be inappropriate to single out this group for special attention. This was in 2007, pre-ISIS. This was the U.S. government policy towards us. That was pre-ISIS. What about the Assyrian question pre semel In 19, don't worry about reading this. In 1932, there was an exchange between Her Majesty's representation in Iraq and Marshamun, the suited Marshamun. In that exchange, Her Majesty's representative says to Marshimun, your beatitude, I have forwarded to the Secretary of State the Assyrian petition of the 17th of June, and the British government are now in communication with the League of Nations Secretariat with a view to arranging for its early consideration by a competent League body, an Assyrian question <coughs> committee at the League of Nations. Marshman, this is 1932, Marshman wrote back to Sir Francis Humphreys and said, by the way, Sir Francis Humphreys was asking the Assyrians through Chesutet Marshman to keep their levies in the south where the British needed them. But he was worried about our situation in the north. And so he says, I will promise to do my best in persuading the leaders to consider to consent and the levies to prolong their services in the South. If your excellency will write and assure me on your honor 
that your excellency in the office you represent will do your utmost to support the demands stated in the national petition dated 17th June in 1932 in the following respective quarters, namely your government, the Iraq government, and the League of Nations, and also inform me of the future of the, the levy condition. The Assyrian Patriarch Marshall That was in 1932. This is the response. Beatitude. I have received your message of the 25th of June. It is my duty to explain that some of the demands contained in the Assyrian National Petition appear to be in conflict with the declared policy of my government and the League. So our demands, our needs, were in conflict with the United Kingdom and the entire international system. I undertake to support to the best of my ability with my government and the League of Nations those demands which appear to be reasonable and in conformity with the general policy of my government and the League. Your sincere friend, Francis Humphreys. This was the Assyrian question as foreign determination before Semed. I want you to digest that, to think about what this means. When I say this is a failed model for a hundred years, 2007, 1932, we are not learning. We are not willing to accept these truths. Your policies are not in line, your demands are not in line with the needs of my government. And in 2007, on the basis of relative need, it would be inappropriate to single out this group for special attention. Great Britain, the United States, 1932, 2007. The United Nations Human Rights Council, same thing. Syrian Americans have successfully lobbied, produced legislation, Direct policy action. In 2008, we actually started an Inwear Plains police force based on advocacy, pushing, working the system through Congress. Suddenly, there was an Inwear Plains police force. Five, six months later, it was disassembled by our neighbors. But we did that. Resolutions, too many to count. House Resolution 944 actually was a resolution responding to the authorities in Iraq disbanding our security force. Appropriations, we, we, when I say we, I mean us. You may want to own it or not own it. I'll own it. I was there. $42 million appropriated just for Deshti Dinwa between 2008 and 2011. All of that money was channeled through our oppressors. It wasn't used to empower us. It was used to hurt us, to suffocate us. This is, this is what an appropriation bill looks like. This was in 2008. The bottom line. Um, from the Economic Support Fund for Iraq, not less than 10 million should be provided to assist religious minorities in the Ninwa Plain region of Iraq, of which 8 million should be provided for IDP families and 2 million should be provided for microfinance programs. We've done this. We've worked the system. We've passed legislation. We know how to do it. We know how to do the Assyrian question as foreign determination. But it hasn't served us. It hasn't helped us one bit. In 2012, on the Senate side appropriations, we actually direct action support. 90 days after the enactment of this act, detailing US efforts to help these communities, including assistant, consistent with, assistance consistent with Article 125 of the Iraqi Constitution which is towards the Ninwe Plains province, and assistance in building indigenous community police force in the Ninwe Plains. Nothing came of it. Nothing came of it. Aturaye Syrians have some myths that we've adopted here and here. And we don't seem to be able to let them go. One of these myths is climbing the ladder. We do the Assyrian question as foreign determination. We say, we know what happened to Khisyut al Marshamun and his exchange with the British. We'll learn from that mistake. But we're still following the same model. We're just saying Khisyut al Marshamun made a mistake. We won't make his mistake. But we're still actually working the same model that he was dealing with, that Agha Putrus was dealing with. 
when his when his forces were disbanded and he had to go to the League of Nations. And we've been dealing with it until today. We don't question the model. We question the Assyrians at the time. I don't question the Assyrians at the time. I think they were all amazing. But we were all, including myself, up until 2012, working within one model. The Assyrian question is foreign determination. So we keep thinking, I can do it better next time. The people before me screwed up because they didn't know what they were doing. I'm going to do it better. We don't learn. We blame ourselves. That's climbing the ladder. We blame ourselves. We don't recognize that the system that we're using isn't designed to work for us. The myth of unity. The myth of unity. This is my favorite. If you would all just unify, come with one demand, we'll support you. Do you know that there are over, there are hundreds of political factions in Syria and actually thousands of militias. Most of those political factions and military fact, militia factions shoot one another. They are the most disunified rebellion force you can imagine. The, America supports all of them. The international community is supporting the, the embodiment of disunity. They support it because it's in American interest to support it. They support the most, the force that imbibes disunity. But we sit there and say, wow, we're not unified. They keep telling us we should just unify and they'll help us. And in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, the KRG was given autonomy on a silver platter, a new state following the first Gulf War. Do you know what was the first action of that new state following the first Gulf War in 1991? A civil war. The embodiment of disunity. The KDP and the PUK for four years were slaughtering one another. But the entire time they had American support. But we Assyrians believe what we're told. Or oh, if you would just unify, we'll support you. The myth of unity. And then comes the example of Jews, Armenians, and Kurds. We have convinced ourselves that Jews, Armenians, and Kurds have what they have because they success. Look at how organized they are. Look at how they lobby. Look at how they advocate. Jews, Armenians, and Kurds help themselves develop their own strength, develop their own power. And when it is an American or Russian or one of their interests to work with them, they do. But when it's an American or Western or Russian or any other interest to betray these peoples, they do. The only difference is, is that because these peoples have already been organizing for decades or centuries along the, their question, the Jewish or Armenian or Kurdish question as self-determination, they can absorb the betrayals. We are the only ones who don't learn from that lesson. We can't absorb the betrayals, but we keep inviting new betrayals. So as I said, courage in the face of the truth. We have to acknowledge as a nation that the Assyrian question as foreign determination will not save us. Whether it's in Atra or in Diaspora, the realities are undeniable. Demographic decimation in Atra and in Diaspora, assimilation, weakening organizations, declining membership in the community, disengagement, disaffection. So I'm here talking about Assyrian global governance. But Assyrian global governance to proceed requires the acceptance that the Assyrian question is foreign determination actually has to be rejected. So what, before I tell you what Assyrian global governance is, I want to tell you what Assyrian global governance is not. It is not the AUA, a remarkable organization with a long history, 
established in Pope France and in their founding charter. The AUA diligently advocates the Assyrian cause internationally and promotes the aspirations of the Assyrian nation. It urges democratic governments and international bodies to defend the rights of the Assyrian people. It urges democratic governments and international bodies to defend the rights of the Assyrian people in their ancestral homeland. The Assyrian question is foreign determination. Alamanekhle Rabbi Ivan Kakovich. The International Confederation of Assyrian Nation, ICANN. I'll skip just to Article 9. The Secretary General is to conduct discussions and cons consultations with all the governments and their rep respective representatives indiscriminately. Article after article, ICANN, the Assyrian question as foreign determination. And today there's talk of the Assyrian Parliament. And in their founding materials, The, the, place of the, Assyri uh, the place of the parliament in our nation as the highest Assyrian institution and its role as the representative of our nation in the international community. To engage in laws that allows parliament to represent the Assyrians in international courts for genocide or other acts of aggression as the parliament sees fit, the Assyrian question is foreign determination. We can't let go of this model. It's embedded in our central nervous system as Umtanai. So what is Assyrian global governance? The reorganization of the Assyrian nation globally to begin developing and exercising self-help, self-reliance. No one will save us. No one has saved us. And if we want the world to continue to have Assyrians not just surviving on it, but thriving in it and living in it, we have to develop true mechanisms. We have to reorganize ourselves for self-help and self-reliance. Is Assyrian global governance political? It's an important question, especially for civil society organizations who are the base of this project for Assyrian global governance. Yes, it's political. Because I would argue that being Assyrian today is political. Of course it's our identity. Of course we know who we and what we are. We're physical, you can touch us. We exist. That doesn't have to be political. But when there are governments, when there are systems, and when there are forces trying to remove Assyrians, trying to deny the existence of Assyrians, to say, I am an Assyrian, is a political statement today. Because there are entire political agendas trying to remove us from equations on the ground. So yes, it's political. But no, it is not partisan, it is not factional, and it is not territorially confined. In that sense, Assyrian global governance is not political. It is not about a party, it is not about a movement, it is not about some territorially focused project. In that sense, it is not political. Assyrian global governance is about our survival everywhere and forever. That's how we have to reorganize. It is about strengthening ourselves always. So what the Assyrian Global Governance Mandate as a project is doing is going to Shotapuyate, going to federations, affiliated and unaffiliated, tied into networks, completely independent, standalone, collectivized. The Assyrian Global Governance Mandate is seeking a mandate to bring together people with true expertise, foremost in their fields, whether it's linguistics, I, I'm, by here I mean accomplished professors who in their universities are considered the best in their fields, to develop solutions towards self-help and self-reliance, but in the areas of culture, education, economics, you name it. But it is seeking a mandate from Shota Puyate for this process to begin. Why? Because human capital, which is ingenuity, the ingenuity to devise a new... I don't know what this reorganization looks like. But bringing these experts together without a mandate from Shota Puyate, who understand what it's for, Shota Puyate with the leadership and a membership that says, I understand why this is happening. 
I know why it needs to happen, and I'm waiting for the feedback on what this reorganization means. Without that mandate, it will fail. For the same reason, all those other models I <laughs> described failed, even though I said that they were the Assyrian question is foreign determination, but they also failed because they were a group of people who on their own decided they were gonna do something to save the nation. Very well intentioned, I'm sure, but it's a failed model as well. You need a mandate. You need people, the organizational structure that says, we want you to do this and we're waiting for the feedback. <clears throat> so the human capital plus a mandate has the potential for success. Now, when I was in university, well, I'm still in university, but uh, when I was teaching and a teaching assistant, uh, for four years I handled US government and politics. Um, every year, somewhere between 70 to 90 students. And one of the things they learn about is the US under the Articles of Confederation. I'm sorry that a Canadian is bringing up a reminder on basic US history to a bunch of Americans, but we're all out to buy it, so it's Assyrians speaking to Assyrians about others, Americans. The Articles of Confederation was a crisis scenario. America was not going to exist under the Articles of Confederation, not as America as you know it. It was a bunch of disconnected states loosely tied together, all with absolute veto powers over one another that was falling apart. Militias couldn't be summoned. George Washington couldn't summon enough of a fighting force to resist outside pressures. The British and the French were playing states off one another because these states were so divided amongst themselves and within themselves. It was a crisis. It was a do or die moment. And so these states issued a mandate to a group of remarkable people who met in Philadelphia in 1787 and they met in Philadelphia and reorganized the states under the American Constitution. They developed a new organizing model for a new purpose, a new type of existence. The states mandated them to know. It wasn't the first time. James Madison didn't have his first conversation about the failure of the Articles of Confederation. Alexander Hamilton did not have the first conversation but the failure of Articles of Confederation in 1787. Everyone was talking about it, but it didn't matter how smart you were, how good you were, that you were just meeting to talk about solutions. The mandate changed everything, that the states told them, we need you to meet, we need you to propose a new model for our existence, because the model that exists today, our organizing model that exists today, the Articles of Confederation is failing us. Hence was born the American Constitution. Without that, this America isn't the America that exists. So I can't say what a Syrian global governance will look like because we're at the stage where we're getting the mandate. It needs to be deliberated, then decided, and even after that, it will evolve. But it will be a paradigm shift because it will be only modeled on the Assyrian question as self-determination. Building our strength to build our capacity to help ourselves, because no one else will help us. So we need a mandate to start and mandates to continue until a proposal exists, and then comes ratification and operation. <coughs> Global governance is the long game. The Assyrian Foundation of America has three programs. It's, it's educational component, it's publications, but as well, support for humanitarian crises and needs. When you're focused on IDP aid relief, security, relocation, resettlement, you're focused on basic needs. And we know this. When you're finding food for the day, you're not educating yourself. You don't have time for that. You're falling behind. You are surviving, but you're not growing and developing. You're just meeting your subsistence needs. That is the short game, survival today. Assyrian global governance is the long game. And believe me, it's a tough decision. I've devoted myself to the short game. As an Umtanaya, I've committed myself to this crisis, that crisis, and the next crisis. It took an internal process for me just to begin thinking Assyrians forever, beyond the next enemy, beyond the next land seizure, beyond the next killing 
towards an absolute future where Assyrians exist forever. It's education, it's culture, it's economy. And I want to tell you, this is where I said I have a self-reliant, self-help example that exists through me, but it's ad hoc. It's not systematized. When I started my PhD program, the Assyrian Foundation of America invested in me, supported me with grants and awards. This is a true story because that support from the Assyrian Foundation of America allowed me to continue with an education in which I developed an expertise in constitutional design, governance design. My business, my work, my profession, in fact, my dissertation is on how parliaments are created constitutionally. The Assyrian Foundation of America invested in an Assyrian who developed a skill that six, seven years later is coming back and saying, I can do this for my nation through you. That's the long game. I didn't know when I was receiving the grants that this would be happening. This was ad hoc. This was chance. But imagine when it's systematized. Imagine when it's the norm that this nation is making calculated investments that bear fruit in six, seven, 10, 15 years. That's what you've done through me. If this proceeds, but now imagine that it's deliberate and it's global. So as I said, the Assyrian global governance effort, the mandate is shifting. The Assyrian question is foreign determination to the Assyrian question is self-determination. I've told you it's reorganizing the Assyrian nation globally to begin developing and exercising self-help and self-reliance. I wanna conclude on this note. It is about our empowering ourselves. But the whole idea of empowering ourselves is the end of our victimhood. Not the end of our victimization. God willing, that will happen one day. Victimization will continue. There's a difference between being victimized and becoming a victim here. The Assyrian question as foreign determination is fueled by our sense of victimhood. When you are a victim, all you can think about is reaching out for help, reaching out to others to help you. Psychologically, it fuels itself. You are the victim, you reach out for help, you're not empowering yourself, more people victimize you. So you beg even more for someone else to help you. That is victimhood. We have to regain a belief in ourselves. I see the most amazing nation in my eyes. I can't, like I'm holding back tears. Trust me, if you know me, you know I am. I see things in our nation that make me cry with pride and our strength, our capacity. And yet I see a nation that doesn't believe in itself at times. Because we've internalized victimhood. We've let it define us. Assyrian global governance is about killing victimhood in our nation. It's about learning that we have power. We just have to learn how to reorganize ourselves to make that power real, to make it affect our own situation. And that's Assyrian Global Governance. And I thank the Assyrian Foundation of America for the privilege of speaking to you today. But I also thank the Assyrian Foundation of America for investing in me in self-help and self-reliance when they didn't know they were doing it and I didn't know they were doing it. But these are the lessons that we come to if we can begin to accept the truth. <laughs>